Good afternoon. On behalf of the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science and Dean Valerie Forbes, I would like to welcome you to Frontiers in Science. My name is Kelly Marmel and I'm the Director of Development in the Schmidt College of Science. We are delighted to bring you this free public lecture series each year where you can explore a wide array of topics in science. Frontiers in Science is made possible by the generous donations of our attendees. If you would like to support the series or make a gift to benefit our students, please see me after the lecture or visit us online at science.fau.edu backslash frontiers. Oops, this is coming in. Um, in case you haven't heard, FAU launched a new capital campaign on December 6th, the first campaign in 20 years, Transcending Tomorrow, the campaign for Florida Atlantic University is a bold and ambitious campaign to raise resources in three areas, FAU health, the environment, and scholarships. Let's watch a video that can explain it better than me. Where tomorrow begins. It's our founding motto and our enduring mindset. Because this is a place where problems are solved. Solutions are found and lives are changed for the better. But with the pressing challenges facing our world, looking to tomorrow isn't going far enough. That's why we're expanding our vision beyond the coming day and setting our sights on something even further, even bolder, even better. Because the healthcare system we build today will infinitely improve the lives of people in our region. Scholarships we invest in today will open the doors of opportunity for generations. And the research we fund today will be a more sustainable planet forever. What happens here today change our tomorrow. And what happens tomorrow will transform the future. Make a gift today. And together, we will transcend tomorrow. So, as you can see, it's an exciting time at FAU and an exciting time in the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Uh, I would welcome the opportunity to speak with any of you about the many exciting things that are happening in the college, about the campaign, ways that you can get involved, volunteer opportunities, or other ways that you might support our students. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Luke Willa, Chair of the Department of Physics in the Schmidt College of Science. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and on behalf of the physics department, I would also like to welcome all of you to uh, this exciting lecture series, Frontiers in Science. And if there's one thing we believe in the College of Science is that certainly our society is faced with many challenges, but the solutions are probably going to come from science. And ultimately, that's what keeps us going. That's what inspires our research and the hope to bring solutions to complex problems. And in that spirit, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a good friend and colleague, Dr. Jurgen Rapp. Um, Dr. Rapp got his PhD and undergraduate degrees from the University of Wuppertal in Germany. He has held several positions at leading institutions in fusion energy. And for the last 12 years, he's been a chief scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And as you can see from the title of his talk, he's going to tell us about things that are happening in nuclear fusion, fusion definitely a field that, that is also going to transcend tomorrow. Thank you very much for the introduction, Lou. Great to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> 
I hope this uh, uh, talk is tailored for for your understanding, and you uh, you you will get uh, with it uh, some information you can take home, and I think you learn something. So I'm going to talk about nuclear fusion to combat climate change, the promise of nuclear fusion, and what are our key challenges. And I think it's a timely uh, uh, talk because you probably heard about nuclear fusion in the news in the last couple of months. So I will give a couple of words to that as well in the talk and some background information. So first, give you an introduction of the challenge. So you see here uh, the primary energy consumption in the industrial era. And what you can see is, of course, how this drastically increases since 1800. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, after 1950, you see the drastic increase in the consumption of coal, oil, and gas. And on the top, you see a little bit of nuclear power contributing as a primary energy uh, source. And on top of that, a little bit of wind and solar. So you can see we have a lot of carbon producing energy sources, which we believe causes a problem to climate. And we have to do something about it. So the question is, what do we do about it? Um, the first thing everybody thinks about is, okay, we need to do something for the electricity production. This is on everybody's mind. Uh, this is only the electricity production. And if you translate that back to what you have seen before, the difference is basically uh, in the previous graph, you have all the transportation in there. You have the heavy industries in there, which need energy for production and here you only see the electricity production. Now here the relation is a little bit different. It's still dominated by coal and gas, which increase steadily. Hydropower is of course one source, this is worldwide. Uh, nuclear is a, a strong contribution. And you see actually uh, that you have an increase in solar and wind power, renewable power in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we want to see this growing. Um, we want to see other energy sources growing. The question is, what will be the mix uh, in the future? And uh, I will here, of course, talk about nuclear fusion, but a few words more. Um, what are the greenhouse gas emissions from this electricity production chains? So um, you have the stack emissions, but you have also other chain steps. That's the difference between the dark blue and uh, uh, the light blue, because of course, solar photovoltaic doesn't have any stack CO2 production, but it creates it during the production. For example, most of the uh, utilities who uh, deploy solar power, as does FPNL, purchase solar photovoltaic cells from countries which produce them with coal power plants. Okay, so all of that, what you see here from FPNL, is solar cells you know, produced in Indonesia. And they are almost exclusively used coal power plants for energy production. So you see the strong, uh, of course, production of uh, uh, CO2 grams equivalent per kilowatt hour for lignite and coal. So, uh, you know, the strip coal mining is, is the worst coal you can use for electricity production. Unfortunately, that is a lot. This is used, for example, in Germany a lot, and uh, it's very bad for it. Oil and natural gas is better. So if you use gas, you know, what has been used here in the US from fracking, it will actually reduce the, the CO2 production. So if you can replace coal power plants by gas power plants, it helps. But, you know, you want to go to solar, hydroelectric, biomass, or wind, or nuclear. So uh, the other thing you should consider that not all of those, uh, you know, alternative renewable energy sources are, uh, you know, are ideal, and there's some controversy because if you use biomass, you will have an increased use of land for the energy production. So if you use biodiesel from soy, you know, you use a lot of land here. So you will immediately compete with the agriculture to feed the society which is not ideal. The same is for do, of course, if you use electricity from biomass, ethanol from cellulose, ethan from corn, it's all in the same range. 
win two, and depending, this is a policy driven thing, of course, you know, how far you can put a windmill close to a settlement. Uh, but it is an issue, uh, particularly in Germany, it is a political issue, you know, how many windmills you can put into the country, right, without, uh, you know, uh, getting in conflict with the uh, local communities. Hydropower as well, of course, if you build a dam, right, you will use up uh, land mass. So you can plot that all down, and obviously if you get to uh, large power plants like coal power plants or geothermal or nuclear power, which are, have a high concentration of uh, 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 electricity production, the land use is minimal. And so will be fusion, you know, which you will have to compare uh, to a nuclear power plant. Now, what is fusion? Fusion powers our universe, okay? Without fusion, we wouldn't live, okay? Fusion is the main energy source in our universe. Fusion powers the sun, and this is a picture of the sun, so you see the large sun, you see some instabilities like solar flares here, you know, coming out. This is the Earth to scale. This is interesting. So what you see actually is a phenomena which we will see in our fusion devices as well. And I come back to that. You see a, a magnetic hydrodynamic instability, you know, expelling some of the hot gas out of the sun. And what I will I show you in the subsequent slides is really the challenges we are facing in fusion to kind of mimic, you know, that what the sun does in our smaller apparatuses, okay? We do have instabilities, which could be detrimental for us. And we have to get to an energy source, which is more compact. You know, obviously the sun is too big, okay? And if you compare the, the watts the sun produces, okay, watts per volume compared to that of a fusion reactor, we are several factors of magnitude higher in power density in the end in a fusion reactor here on the earth than what the sun does. Okay, so fusion is not new, okay? We know about fusion since a while. So this is a report from the National Academy of Engineering which says the energy from fusion as a human engineered fusion has already been demonstrated on a small scale, long, long time ago, okay? Um, the challenges facing the engineering community are to find ways to scale up the fusion process to commercial proportions in an efficient, economical, and environmentally benign way. And that's the challenge we are facing. This report is about 20 years old, okay? So, you know, they come out regularly, those National Academy of Sciences reports and National Academy of Engineering. So, let me take you to, through the fusion process. The fusion process which for us is the most promising, there are many fusion processes, okay? I should say that, you know? And you gain energy with each of them, right? So you have a maximum, you know, you, you can either get energy out by splitting atoms, which are high, high Z ones, okay? You know, and the high Z, those are the blue numbers here on the periodic table, right? And iron is somewhere in the middle, right? And everything which is lighter than iron, you can fuse, you know, to gain energy. And, you know, the gained energy is right, just what Einstein said, right? Delta E equal MC squared. So the highest efficiency fusion process is that of hydrogen. We use isotopic hydrogen, it's deuterium and tritium. Isotopic means it's like the normal hydrogen, but it has a couple of neutrons more, okay? So we fuse deuterium and tritium. For that, we have to make it hot like 200,000 degrees Celsius. That's what we have to, you know, heat it up to. Uh, then this has to collide. It collides, and when it collides, it forms helium, okay? And uh, so you will find out if you measure the mass of the deuterium and tritium, okay, and add it up, and then you measure the mass of the helium at the end, uh, at, at the end of the process, you know, that the reduced mass is smaller, so you gained energy, and the energy is transformed in kinetic energy to the uh, helium nucleus, you know, it gets three and a half MeV and a fast neutron. So one of the neutrons gets out and flies out at 14 MeV. So that's the process. You have to stay that energy in to heat it up. You know, we talk in electron volts in terms of temperature. So we transform this, 
you know, 200 degrees Celsius into electron volts. So we put that in, get that out, factor of 420, all right? So we have to heat this to get up to the temperature. Um, in a sustained process, this is actually a circle so that alpha particle that helium will reheat your determined tritium. So that's the trick. So for a burning plasma, I'll come back to later. So basically, that alpha particle has to reheat the determined tritium. Um, what happens then that you will get that neutron, uh, which can transfer all the material to the outside and will then be decelerated uh, in lithium. So you know lithium, lithium oxide, batteries, okay? We will have lithium in a blanket at the edge. Why do we use lithium? Because the lithium will breed our fuel. So there's a transmutation process. When the neutron hits the lithium, it will produce our tritium. So we produce that tritium because tritium is not available on Earth. It has a half time of 12 years, which means, what is that half time of 12 years? Uh, if you would have tritium and you let it on a table, you have like two parts of tritium on the table, you wait 12 years, one part is gone, okay? It's the decay process, right? So even if there would have been tritium at some point on Earth, it would have been all decayed and you don't have that natural. So you have to produce it. So you produce it by breeding it by capturing the neutron. So that's the process. So we pro produce our fuel here. So we will use that. And by that process, of course, it's a lot of energy that neutron has. It will heat up that lithium. So we extract that heat from the lithium. We extract that heat from that alpha particle, which bombards the wall. And we extract that then through turbines, like in a normal power plant, okay? And we generate electricity. This is the very basic process of fusion. So just a comparison, what's, what's the you know, fusion reaction towards this chemical reaction? So it, for example, you know, everybody talks about the hydrogen economy now, right? So <clears throat> use hydrogen and oxygen, you produce water, and you get some energy, 3D, okay? That use eight nucleons, so you get out of it 0.7 EV per nuclear. You do that for fusion, you have five nucleons here. You get helium and neutron out there, you get 7.6 MeV, okay? That's three and a half million per nucleon. What you can see, the efficiency versus a chemical reaction is 20 million. 20 million is the difference. Burning coal is really primitive in comparison to fusion. If, you know, that's the difference. Chemical reactions versus fusion. Now, already 100 years ago, chemical, you know, scientists, here the uh, Nobel Prize Award winner, Francis William Astom said, you know, to change the hydrogen in a glass of water into helium would release enough energy to drive the Queen Mary across the Atlantic and back at full speed. That's the amount of power which is in that glass of water, okay? So people realized that already 100 years ago. So it's not really new. So what are our approaches to harness that? So there are two principal approaches to that. The one is inertial confinement. And you have heard a lot about that new splash just in November about that. Inertial fusion was the Lawrence Livermore lab, which has done that, which produces plasmas, you know, which has a very high density, 10 to the 27 per cubic meter, okay? But the fusion process is very short. It's a nanosecond. It's really like a flash, right? Whereas magnetic confinement, where I will talk about later, where I'm more expert with it, you know, has lower density plasmas. And uh, the advantage is you can go to longer sustained seconds you know, and I will show the latest records on that, seconds long processes. So you actually produce a lot more energy. It's power, power versus time is energy. So how does that look like? You know, inertial fusion, you know, there are two approaches to that again. So you use uh, either, you know, a, oh, no. 
button, I apologize. I thought it was a laser button, but it wasn't. He is back. Okay, perfect. So you use a small capsule, they call it a whole realm, which is funny, you know, it's a German word for cavity. You know, I don't know why they adopted the German name. Uh, that's used in Livermore, where you basically shoot in with lasers, you know, into that little capsule. And inside, you know, uh, the laser beams are reflected from that golden cylinder and uh, it's transformed into x-rays and the x-rays then compress that fuel. It's like a small grain, at least to an implosion and then the fusion process. There's a direct drive, what they call it here at the University of Rochester. So where you shoot with a laser straight on that uh, fuel, okay? Those are two basic, uh, 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 you know, approaches. I will talk about this year a little bit more. This has been more successful. So what's magnetic confinement? I will, since this is my topic where I work on, I want to you know, talk a little bit more about it. So when particles are so hot, as I said, 20 million degrees, that means they're ionized. So if you have hydrogen, the electron is removed, okay? So it's so hot that the, the electron doesn't you know, spin around the, the uh, core anymore. So the electron is free, the ion is free. So you have a positive charged ion, a negative charged electron and they move freely, okay, except if you have a magnetic field. So your old TV, remember, you know, that you guide the electrons to your uh, surface. So <clears throat> how to stop the losses of that? So you, you capture that uh, in a magnetic field, and there are two solutions how to do that. So, you know, they spiral along, you know, across those magnetic fields just in your old TV, yeah, you had. Uh, and in your TV, it hits the front and makes the picture. And for fusion, that's a problem because you lose the particles that way. Okay? You need to keep them in there. So what people do, they actually increase the magnetic field in that magnetic bottle and try to keep it inside. Okay? That's what people in the 50s did, and it didn't work out very well. Okay? So they gone away from that. So from the linear arrangement, now they go to what they call their closed flux tube. So what they do... They have a tube and, and you bend it around, you know, you make like a donut, okay? So you can circle in there, in the donut, there's no end to it, okay? That's what we call a toroidal system. Now, when people have done that first, they also found out that that didn't work well. And the reason for that was, you know, that in that configuration where you have centrifugal forces, you know, and you have the charges, you find out that the electrons and the ions drift in opposite direction. Uh, which led to an instability and the plasma, you know, exploded. So you have to come to a system which compensates that. And that's what they found then actually, um, that you need a helical field. So you need to mix the electrons and the ions so that not the electrons go to the top and the ions go to the bottom. So you have to mix them and you have to come to that, what we call uh, tokamak principle, which shows you here that you have a toroidal magnetic field uh, produced by some coils, and then you induce a current in that plasma uh, by another coil here in the center, okay? It's just like your ordinary transformer, only that your winding is that plasma, that pink color plasma here. And then you get a poloidal magnetic field, which makes that twist in the magnetic field. And uh, the Russians have come up with that design in the 60s, you know, that was a success and is at the moment the, the leading confinement uh, concept for magnetic fusion. Alternatively, if you don't want to have that transformer principle and induce a current here, so that's the current, you can, with complicated ways, and I don't want to go into details, you can bend all those coils, okay, and come to a structure, it's called stellarator, you know, where you can also have this movement of mixing this helical field, okay? This, this, you know, everybody would see this is a nice piece of art, okay? Right? This has been designed by computer scientists in Germany, you know, this Stellarator concept. So it's, uh, it's the theoreticians idea. I thought it worked. Right, 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 right. So, okay, so this is a little bit, I have to go here quickly because I probably cannot take all the time. So uh, what are the conditions to sustain the reactions of fission? 
in a reaction needs to pro, you know, propagate by neutrons. You, you know, you don't want to lose the neutrons. In fusion, you have the problem for the reaction to propagate. Conditions must be maintained. So, um, so the power must be large enough to compensate for the losses. That's the problem in fusion. And here, I have to shortly go through this because you understand where the problem was, why it takes always so long. So the fusion process is the only, really the only true equations I show here, I promise, okay? So uh, this has a density and this has some cross section with the function of temperature and velocity space. So uh, plus the external power you put in there to heat this plasma. So this is basically the power you get. And then you have losses on the other side. And the losses are radiation losses. So just like the, the sun produces radiation, that's what you get here. You want to harness this with photovoltaics, you know, and our reactor will have that too. For us, that will be losses, okay? That scales with density and temperature again. And then you have something like convection and conduction. Remember, I showed you a picture of the sun. We have that big thing that solar flare coming out, you know, that you have convective fluxes coming out due to instabilities. You have to minimize that. It's a loss. Okay. Now you can put those equations together. And uh, the important thing is here with that convection and conduction, you have something like that, and uh, which I want to use that term to explain to you, it's called energy confinement time. And, uh, you know, everybody knows that from house building, right? How long can you keep you know, the temperature in the house, right? You know, if you have bad windows, you know, you have no insulation in the walls, you know, you know, whatever you put in that heat will diffuse quickly out. The better you insulate it, and that's the end, you know, you can make your energy confinement so it stays longer in there, prove that. So that's a critical thing. So you write that out, so you find out that you have to achieve a density times that confinement time it has to be larger than a function of temperature. Right? That's what we call the so-called Lawson criteria. And I draw that up here. So this is, you know, if you want to get to a burning plasma without any external power, you have that burning plasma. What you get to is ignition. That's where ETA is. That's where you have to go. You have to go, as I said before, to those temperatures, you know, uh, 20, 30 kV, like 20 million degrees Celsius, right? So that's where you need to go. If you don't have, uh, you know, you write on that, that you don't need external power, we call this break even, this is Q equal one. And what I'll show you later where that, all that splash was, Q equal one means you get as much energy out as you put in. That was the big splash, what you heard in November, right? Well, Livermore achieved just that. So you can see, and I have not included the Livermore results here. You see all those experimental results. You see some results from JET where I worked on, from TFTR, which was an experiment in Princeton. So they came close, but they didn't achieve the Q equal one, okay? So what you, I want you to take away from that, you have to go to very high density plasmas. Not all the fusion concepts have the high density plasmas. Everything which doesn't have high density plasmas will likely not work well. Um, so all that has an impact on the fuel cycle and the material you want to use. This is the largest tokamak and fusion device operational to date, is JET, Joint European Taurus in the UK. I was working there for, I don't know, eight years or something like that, on and off. So contributed actually for, you know, design of those components down there. Did run experiments on that. So that's how a tokamak looks from the inside. Yeah, okay. So that's, so let me say, uh, from here, the center to there is three meters. A person would, if you stand a person from here, it will probably up to here. Okay. That's the Stellarator. In Germany, it's the largest Stellarator, you know, that was a twisted coils, which I showed you before. Um, it's in Greifswald, Northern Germany. This shows the, you know, where they had the first plasma in 2014, Chancellor at the time. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't show the inside, right? So just show you what has been achieved. So
So the largest stock mine in the US was in Princeton, was in the plasma physics, uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. And uh, they were the first ones actually in 1994 to show that they can get close to Q to 10, uh, to 0.44, which is not one, right? One where you want to go for break even. Jet has shown in 1997 they can go to 70%. They all wanted to achieve one, but they haven't, okay? So uh, then everybody said, well, why can you not get that? And I get to that later. But so, <clears throat> so what you show here, those are short pulses, okay? This was TFTR in Princeton. This was Jet in 97 in the UK, close to, uh, to Oxford. And then they have done also uh, some longer pulses here, okay? So yeah, people were not really happy, you know, for the short time. Uh, a, this was short time, B, uh, they didn't go to one. But what I want to show you now, that actually the last couple of years, the fusion community has made tremendous progress. And I want to show you that. So just recently, you know, JET has done another deuterium tritium campaign. They have more heating power in there now, more reliable heating power. They have optimized the operation of the machine. And what you have seen before are those two dots, right? Those were, you know, this was jet before, 60 megawatt. They almost got to that level again, but they stretched that out to much longer. With that, they got to a released fusion energy of about 60 megajoule, okay? Keep that number in mind, because if you compare it to that little laser blip, which was announced in November, this is way more, okay? So the importance is here, the duration. You, know, you sustain it for a longer time. But then here, ignition. You saw that all on CNN, right? Ignition, the big splash. We got for the first time more energy out than we put in. There's a slide Tammy Ma provided to me. Uh, <clears throat> so what have they done? So I can truly say this program has, has received a lot of funding and they have made a lot of promises. And when they were supposed to do, uh, you know, the experiments and they were disappointed it was really that they didn't foresee the confinement could be that bad. You know, the energy confinement I told you before, the insulation, okay, they got that all wrong in the computation. So then they worked dil diligently on that. Um, so you see, you know, that's, what, that's where they were, you know, like 10 years ago, it was horrible. And they slowly improved this capsule design. So this small capsule design, you know, the lasers, nothing changed really. So they improved that capsule design and you see in 2021, they got up in fusion energy here. So this is the maximum laser energy they've in there, okay? This is, you know, what they achieved for each pulse. And then in 2022, end of 2022, they got that pulse here. So you can see they got three megajoule out for two going in. So they got 50% more energy out than they put in. And that was the success. And what was the reason for that success was mainly target quality. So that little cylinder to optimize the precision, the laser accuracy, the timing, how all those lasers, you know, they have 192 lasers. All together, this is the biggest laser on the planet. You know, when they release all the energy, that is all stored, it's only a nanosecond long. But that power, that instant power they release at that moment is more than the whole electricity grid of the United States in that one instant, okay? So they optimized that, optimized the diagnostic capabilities and they got there. So what this shows for me, they understood to produce those capsules a lot better. They understood how to improve the energy confinement and it was perseverance of those scientists then. That's, you know, congratulations for this. But now, this was three megajoules. I want to tell you this, right? It's a short pulse. I told you before, 60 megajoules for magnetic fusion. And this was not even the end. That this is not the principle. In China, in the superconducting tokamak experiment, they did run an experiment, not with DT, with those isotopes, but they did run it for a thousand seconds. So you can run tokamaks long. You can run them for a thousand seconds. And also a result just published in 2023, Science Advice. So those are significant steps forward, you know, in the fusion process. So what we need to do is investigate those burning plasmas. But this is the next large scale step. 
basically where you get significant power out, more out than you put in. So, you know, people always say, oh, it takes so long, right? We started here in the 70s, right? We improved, you know, the fusion power all the way, like Moore's law, right? Moore's law for the semiconductor is similar uh, progress. But then there was a gap. Largely political, I don't want to go through the details, but there was a gap, and you know, each is not over here. So if you're not familiar with each, each is an international uh, thermonuclear uh, experimental reactor in the southern France, which has partners of the United States, European Union, Russia, Korea, China, India, and they're building the largest device which should release 500 megawatt of fusion power. So this is what currently is being built on, okay? So, um, but it's a big device. It costs a lot of money. That's why you need all the partners around the world to do it. It was initiated by Reagan and Gorbachev in the mid eighties. So, uh, and they're still building on it. And it's painful, I know, but we have to wait for it because this is the only device, this shows a drawing of it, which will be able to study the burning plasma. Burning plasma means, as I said before, the hot helium will sustain the heating of the deuterium and tritium. So it will keep the plasma hot. I don't have to put any energy in. It's like you start a fire, right? You start a wood fire and you have to blow always, blow always. That's not sustained burning plasma. That's not sustained burning fire. Sustained burning fires, if you don't have to put, you know, blow the fire, you know, in there to bring oxygen in there. So it, it burns on itself. So that's the mission of that experiment, ITER. That's how the site looks like. I think this is a year old. It's not the latest. They have actually, I think the control room has now been built here. Um, this is, you know, this is the main uh, uh, Taurus Hall and this is the view in the Taurus Hall, the assembly phase. So uh, I don't know if you see the scale here where there's a person, but it's pretty impressive. You know, you, you know. so uh, there's a great progress here. Now, what are the challenges? And I know somebody will remind me time now. So I will, and, and there are remaining challenges. So fusion plasma science and burning plasma science is really plasma physics challenge. So, and the other one is fusion nuclear science, which is the enabling technology. Unfortunately, right now, still the community spends more effort in the US on the plasma physics that try to improve, you know, the plasma performance to potentially go to more efficient reactors, but we have to spend more effort, you know, on developing those structural materials for those reactors and develop the fuel cycle. That's the challenge which is remaining. And I promise you, okay, this might be looking too scientific to you. For the, This is for the audience who are a little bit more familiar with that. So each of us built based on data of many experiments around the world. And they took all the data and basically made the regression fit on that for the uh, energy confinement and scaled that to where they have to go. It was kind of almost empirical, okay, when they did it. But we are in the era now where we have high performance computers and we can actually start to simulate, you know, all those particles in the plasma. That's what people do. They use, you know, sophisticated codes try to paralyze them, run them on supercomputers, like we have in Oak Ridge, Frontier, the high, you know, biggest, fastest computer in the world. So you can actually simulate, you know, all those instability, the turbulence, yeah, like turbulence you would have you know, on the wing of an airplane, for example, you know, it's a challenge. So, and what people found that actually most experiments are in this, and I don't want to explain that a little further, you know, what we have now in this BOM regime, this is, this is a parameter which goes with the size. So the bigger the machine, the larger this gets here. Uh, so if we go to a burning plasma, this physics transport mechanism might kick in. So we need a large experiment to validate those codes. This is something I worked on. This is a problem with other instabilities. Similar to that flare, we have instabilities at the edge, which expel a lot of energy. So what you see here is actually time trace of such a discharge, okay? And you see the red line, you know, spiking here, okay? 
And uh, so that shows radiation, and this shows energy. So the energy drops, and every energy drop is a megajoule, and it comes in one millisecond. So you have a gigawatt of power released suddenly, and if it hits the wall, it will bring a problem. And I'll show you a little movie. I hope it works. This is how this shot of energy here, okay? So you have this, like the solar flares, you know, you have the solar winds which come to the earth, right? Your solar, the sun expels energy, they come to the earth and you have spikes, they're smoothed out of course. This is kind of similar. It's instabilities at the edge when you look at it, with other cameras, uh, you will see that they are similar to the solar flares. Although, I mean, I don't want to go into physics details, the dimensions and the collisionalities are completely different. But, you know, there's some, some similarities. So, <clears throat> what does it do to materials? If you don't do anything about it, this has been done and simulated with tungsten, you know, and you see, you know, where basically a material was hit with that uh, plasma stream of that intensity and it melts. Okay, tungsten melts. It leads to cracks, you know, at the edges, and that's not good. Okay, you know, if your material cracks, and it's a similar problem. This heat fluxes are a similar problem you have it in other engineering applications. We have to do something about it. Um, there are other, and so how, what you do with those instabilities? People have found out, and I jump over that because it's very technically, you want to get rid of that. You see those spikes here. And now you have a phase where you got rid of them, and it's when you add other magnetic field cores. So you try to simulate, uh, try to affect the plasma edge by putting some other magnetic uh, coils at the edge, and then, <clears throat> and then uh, you know, get rid of them. This was a pioneering work I did at General Atomics in San Diego. Uh, very good work. Now, in the worst case, actually, your plasma doesn't recover. You have a dis what we call disruption. You know, so suddenly you get instability and the plasma ends and all the energy is suddenly released to the edge. You know, it's kind of, I mean, I don't want to compare it to a supernova or something like that, where everything explodes, you know, it comes to the outside. But you have to deal with this because it would hit the wall. So we try to develop techniques to detect it. And that is shown here where we are able to basically detect when such an instability is about to happen and then we send in with such an apparatus, like a giant wine screw, it's like a, a large cryogenic hydrogen pellet, like the size of a wine screw, we shoot it in and cool the plasma down very quickly so that it cannot expel all the energy to the wall. Okay. That's how we kill asteroids, basically. So <clears throat> I think I jump over that. So there are other instabilities which you could have in a burning plasma. They're driven by the hot ions, we call them you know, energetic particles, which is simulated here and measured actually also in some other structures. So simulation and, and measured structures do agree very well if you compare this here, simulate with the computer and it's measured. So those are instabilities which would be in the core and could potentially reduce that energy confinement. So this is a threat. So even though we might go to a burning plasma, this could be a threat and could be put a damper on the uh, deployment of that. Another one is the power exhaust. So we have, in addition to those uh, rapid instabilities, we have steady state flux and just compare that what we have. In ETA steady state, you know, we have heat fluxes, you know, 10 megawatt per square meter, and then we have those transients, as I said, gigawatts per square meter. Just compare that, re-entry vehicle, about a megawatt per square meter. The space shuttle rocket nozzle, you know, several tenths of megawatt per square meter, but, you know, it doesn't have to run for two years, you know. The rocket nozzle only has to hold up a couple of minutes before you're in space. So I worked on, you know, on scenarios how to minimize the power to those plasma facing components. So you have a system in the bottom, which we call the exhaust system there the magnetic field lines go open and they hit the wall here. You have to have that because you have to pump out your ash. It's like, you know, your 
your chimney where you, you know, have to get the ash in the bottom out, right? You know, you have to take out the helium here. So you have to have it. And the problem is that where the open magnetic field lines hit the material here, you erode it. So I've come up together with our friend Jeff Omge now with radiation scenarios where we introduce radiation impurities and basically we dissipate all the power before it gets down there. So it's radiated, distributed. So, you, you know, it doesn't hit the target. And if that's not enough, people work on a uh, novel uh, configuration where, you know, they want to expand the footprint, you know, just, you know, basically, you know, put this on a, on an angle here or expand this by what they call snow flock diverter or put long legs in here to the outside. There's several ways how you could combine that basically to reduce the power to that plate here. So you could split that further up to several locations so that your heat flux goes down. It's all about the management of the heat flux through those components. This is still an important research and in the in the latest developments in the private industry we are coming later to, they will utilize actually uh, those novel concepts to get over that. Now, when your plasma hit the material, then uh, you know it modifies it, okay? So you have the particle impact here, it hits there, part of it goes in there, you erode the material, some of it comes back, it deposits there, you get a sick layer, and part of it, the neutrons get in there and uh, lead to transmutation. And that changes your material. Some have that tested that in laboratories. And I want to go through this. There's just some pictures here, what it does to tungsten, the primary candidate for those plasma facing components. You can see what it does. It roughens the surface, leads to blisters at the grain boundary. They could all pop out, like shown here. You know, <laughs> that's terrible. Or you, if you have helium in there, it leads to nano extrusions of the tungsten. So tungsten grows like air out of the material. Also not a good idea because you could get some arcing, wipe it all off. You get good melting and you get melt layer splash. So those are all processes which could threaten, you know, basically the longevity of our plasma facing components, and we need to investigate that. In addition, you know, there are the structural material challenges uh, where the neutrals would damage your material. So um, I don't want to go through this in detail, but fusion is that yellow box, okay? So what I want to tell you, our damage is much higher than any of those nuclear reactors we have currently. And we go to much higher temperatures. So the challenge of fusion is much higher than that of ordinary fission reactors. And for that, it will make it difficult, you know, to find the appropriate structural materials which live long enough. Now, what does it do to the material? And here's some illustrative degradation phenomena just to show you what it does, you know radiation hardening for the mechanical engineers among you, your stress was strain, you know, so you put, you know, increased uh, uh, stress in it, at some point strain, it breaks, okay? You have irradiation creep here, so at some point over time, as creep as you rattle it back and forth, it breaks. You get volumetric swelling, so you see how material can grow because, you know, the irradiation and its transmutants will lead to swelling of the material. Get phase instability uh, by a precipitous because you have transportation, other elements are better to it. Uh, and if you produce helium, which um, is a decay product here, they accumulate at the grain boundary. You can, you know, this is a electron microscope, shows how it accumulates at the boundary, and that leads to embrittlement of materials. So those are severe challenges for those nuclear materials where people in Oak Ridge actively work on finding new materials which can deal with those harsh conditions. Fuel cycle. So I said that before we have, you know, to breed our tritium. And so at the edge, uh, you know, we, we, we have to actually decelerate the neutrons into those lithium pebbles, okay? So this is something which hasn't been done yet because we never intended to breed tritium for us and we never intended yet you know, to have a closed fuel cycle. All of the fusion experiments you hear about have not solved this. This is an ultimate thing right now. We have a lot of private industry coming to Oak Ridge and want to know how to build this, you know. Okay, few words from me, and I'm coming close to the end here. So what, why does it take so long to develop fusion? Everybody asks that question. Everybody knows, 30 years ahead. It's complex, okay? It's more complex than everything else. 
except cancer research. That's complex. The body is complex. It hasn't solved the solution yet. Right? It needs large, expensive devices to go there. Everything, everybody who tells you, you can do that in a small suitcase. I told you already, ETER is a big device, okay? And it will have a power density, you know, thousands times higher than that of the sun. To do that in a suitcase, it's not possible. It's risky and hence mostly funded by government. But I tell you what, something changed. So those experiments have a long life cycle, unfortunately. TFT operate for 15 years, JET operate for 40 years, compared to a car, so life cycle of seven years. So you don't have those iterations. You know, the car, they have one car, they deploy it, then they develop the next one, the next one, the next one. Infusion just becomes expensive, you know, because you cannot go quickly from generation to generation, okay? So, and because of that, many of the devices were actually developed with old technology. So GFTR are based on technology from the 70s. The National Ignition Felicity is based on the technology of the 80s. So many people say, yeah, they achieved a Q of 1.5, but if I take into account the laser energy, ah, you know, it's still nothing. But you have to keep in mind, those lasers are from the 80s. Modern lasers are much more efficient. So that's why we don't take that into account because we look at the science and not the technology. If you would build a new thing with new lasers, the situation would be completely different. Either the same thing. So also keep in mind, if you look at the news, first, every company or whatever does, you know, can do small experiments very quickly and make progress. But as they get closer to a burning plasma, they get bigger, they become more expensive and will take longer. So what happens now is that actually fusion technology develops. And I think we can, uh, you know, base this on the new disruptive technologies. So this is something which plays into our favor here that there's a development of high temperature superconductors for the magnets advanced in additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence for data mining and improving our understanding of, of the data we have achieved, high performance computing for predictive modeling of materials, of confinement concepts, and to develop advanced materials of extremes. And this has been realized in the last FISAC, stands for uh, Fusion Energy Sciences Advisory Committee. This is an advisory committee for the Department of Energy. I was six years on that panel. So they advise what the government should do. And basically that report says that we should pivot in the research towards fusion materials and technology program, reduce US tokamak operations, go to the technology development so that we come to a deployment. And uh, what I want to go through because of limited time, I just want to say completion of the material plasma exposure experiment because that's one of the issues where the, you know, we have to investigate how the plasma interacts with the material. And that's exactly what I work on. So I came to Oak Ridge 12 years ago to initiate that device, um, which is a, is a new world leading device, which currently being built in uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, which should basically test those conditions where the plasma hits the wall. Okay, it's currently under, under construction at, uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab. Now, what also has emerged now, very interestingly, is actually driven by, you know, the society's realization that we have to do something about energy. And there's an enormous funding in the private arena. Those are all private fusion companies and they need new enthusiastic staff. You know, they have amassed investments up to now of $5 billion, okay? And I tell you what, they go much faster than the government. If fusion will be realized, it will be fusion industry. Here's one example of one of the most promising approaches is come, uh, well, fusion systems, they use high temperature superconducting magnets. They have demonstrated that already in record time. They built this. They built now spark a reactor who could actually, in principle, do the same thing ETA will do. And they, they promise to do it in the next couple of years. This is private industry can go at much faster speed than government can do. And that's why I'm so positive for the future 
<coughs> this is the famous Russian physicist, Lev Asimovich, the father of the Tokamak said, fusion will be ready when society needs it. And I think if this is the time now. Society needs fusion, and they will be ready. Thank you for your attention. Full Raum, full Raum. No, uh, the whole Raum, so the materials I showed were like, so the material changes there, right? Uh, got damaged. Now, those are um, experiments that did where they just irradiated with neutrons materials and then made tests on it the whole realm will be completely disappeared, okay? But yeah, no, there's no whole realm anymore after the experiment, it's gone, okay? It's an, it's an implosion, right? A nuclear implosion, there's no whole realm anymore after that. You, you talk about the, the laser fusion. Yeah, the challenge is so the idea is that they will drop those capsules at a rate of 10 hertz, zap it, you know, 10 times per second, okay, and then extract the power. This is a significant challenge, okay? And I come from magnetic fusion, and I believe this is, this is a huge challenge, and I think magnetic fusion is closer to deployment. I don't want to say it's impossible but they, they, they need to overcome significant issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I, I apologize. I think I went too fast over that. So we have to breed tritium ourselves. So the neutron which comes out will be decelerated, captured by lithium, and you will have a transmutation where you get tritium out of it. So we will produce the fuel ourselves in the device. Okay. There's not enough on the planet. <clears throat> There's not enough supply on the planet otherwise. So every fusion reactor will have to produce the fuel itself. That's the plan. Yeah, there are many other fusion processes. People focus on the term tritium because it's the easiest to obtain. Uh, many other processes require even higher temperatures than the 20 million, okay? You need to go even to higher temperatures. The term helium-3, you could use that. There's also the problem you have to mine helium-3 on the moon first, but you could think about a business model and get it here to Florida, right? Space Coast. But it's, you know, uh, you know there are many fusion processes, right? Um, so, it uh, depends on your device, okay, because it <clears throat> is limited usually by, um, you know, when you can use the coils again, okay, because the coils, a jet, for example, the coils heat up. If you have a superconductive magnet, you don't have that problem, okay. Um, maybe the, the, the center column has it, but a jet really where I did do experiments, you know, depending 
depends on the strength of the magnetic field. In the worst case, you have to wait half an hour, but actually that's what it takes to extract the data. Usually the data guys are the slowest guys, you know, to, you know, have the data acquisition completed, you know. No, what should be clean? No, there's no cleaning. Yeah, between 10 and 50, 60 million, whatever we want to do it. Correct, correct. We, so we cool it down in a diverter, okay? And in a diverter, it's, okay, I have to translate that. It's, um, it tends to hundred thousands of degrees Celsius. Yeah, where it hits the material. Tends to several hundred thousand, depending how we run it, degrees Celsius. hot and the material get hot and we have to develop those materials in extremes but don't forget re-entry similar problem right and you know all about it you know space shuttles have to come in and you know get through that you know uh, part of their journey through you know for re-entry with if you don't have the task properly done you can damage your space shuttle Cold fusion. Cold fusion, right? I don't I don't know about cold fusion. Yeah, yeah but if you get to a high temperature, something will increase. So you mean the density only increase, but not the temperature? So the cold fusion they had before was palladium, right? They captured it and they thought they could, you know, get to extremely high densities there. And the neutrons they measured were in the noise, okay? In the end, it turned out it was in the noise, you know? There are, I should say, there are confinement devices which make use of higher pressure. There are funky systems which have actually a lot of pistons called general fusion. They use a smoke ring. This is still a plasma, it's not cold. It's maybe not as hot as what we have, okay? So they're lower temperature. So you can go on the lower temperature range, but then you have to go really high density. And they try to get there by actually compressing it, uh, putting a shock wave of liquid metal through pistons. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not so familiar with this. General Fusion, if you want to look that up, it's a private company which pursues this, so, you know, you. Uh, maybe you can learn some more. For, I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful, but I'm, you know, this is, and then, and then there is the high density range of the inertial fusion, but they still get to high temperature. Yeah. 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 The stellarator, sorry, I probably didn't explain that properly. So the tokamak works like the transformer principle. So if you go through the flex swing, it has the parts. Unless you can, like East has shown that you can drive the current, okay? Stellarators could in principle run state state. That's the advantage. Stellarators don't have any instabilities related to the current. So they, you know, turn them on and it runs. Is very complex and they'll likely be larger because the confinement is not as good. Because that twist in the magnetic field leads to an enhanced transport. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> That's a good point. AI. What's the what? What's the biggest contribution AI can make to fusion? So I think the first thing is that you um, you can 
you know, read all the data, okay, from the experiment, and with this, you know, in, in a more intelligent way, do those predictions, which otherwise physicists did do, you know, the energy confinement, you know, I've shown you that graph with the regression, right? AI can likely do that a lot better, okay? And with that, do certain extrapolations, hopefully. Um, you can also do it a little bit more clever where maybe computations are too much involved for predictions where you can only do in the, you know, like doing, doing those predictions with those geokinetic codes with all the particles in the plasma, those calculations take a long time, even on the supercomputers. So you make only a few simulations of pulses, okay? So if you do that, you do a few of those predictive calculations, which are very precise, but then use AI later, even looking back to your calculations that would help. The same will be true for materials. You know, for materials, materials by design, you know, you can start up with up initial molecular dynamics simulations, you know, to understand what the materials behavior. Typically, if you want to do this for, for a whole component or for your wall, it would take forever. Okay, <clears throat> so you do that in certain areas, okay, and then you map that, interpolate that, and you can use AI for that as well. 